All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Age of Information. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick. And uh, today is one of those episodes that I've been playing around with in my head for a couple of months now. And uh, today just worked out <laughs> where I have this two hour block of time where I can't really do anything except be stuck in this room. Uh, not super long story. There's housekeepers here doing some cleaning and the dogs are with my wife and I'm sort of either I'm somewhere else outside of the house or I'm stuck in this room. And I thought this would be a great time to try to, to um, dissect and maybe hash out a little bit of what I've been, what I've been thinking about here um, and how I want to do this. So one of the the things that we talk about here a bunch is the, um, the idea of uh, the, tr the tr what transcendental argument, right? The transcendental argument or the transcendental argument for God. Uh, and then of course, presuppositionalism. And presuppositionalism as a Christian apologetic has its roots really in Cornelius Van Thiel uh, and then later on Greg Bonson. And there's some other folks in this arena, too, that you can um, kind of look at if you want to pull out some some aspects here and there. Um, obviously, these guys are, are Protestants, uh, Calvinists, a reformed tradition to be to be specific. Um, and uh, they're, they're not in any way Orthodox Christians. I mean, capital O Orthodox Christians. Right. But there are, uh, as Protestants sometimes do. Um, they stumble into areas of orthodoxy that are applicable, I think, for our general discussions. And what we do, or at least what I do here, and what I think everyone else that's doing this this type of conver uh, conversing is doing, we are uh, locating, uh, deciphering, and explaining orthodox ideas in um, a classical philosophical way that modern day Americans in 2024 can understand them that removes uh, extracts a bit from the orthodox dogma or doctrine. Let me explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> there are uh, very specific orthodox ways of putting things into context within the phronema, within the worldview, within the paradigm, within the way of life that a phronema is. And sometimes this just clicks for people right away, right? For, for some people, they um, listen to or you know two hours of a podcast four years ago or they attend uh, an orthodox liturgy once and everything just goes off for them and for other people uh, it may never click right there there may be just this just hesitancy for the western mind to m be able to make the move to the eastern orthodox way of thinking because it's a completely different orientation of reality right and then I, I would say most people are probably somewhere somewhere in the middle on the, the uh, continuum right on the stream. So what's helpful a lot of times with these uh, Calvinists or reformed folk, um, Van Thiel being one, Bonson being another, is we can use their descriptions of particular instances where they come close to or parallel orthodox theology or orthodox phronema. And that just offers us another way to explain ideas, principles, whatever that would appeal to or make more sense to a Western analytical mind, right? The Western mind is very uh, separated in a lot of ways in how we view the theology is sort of a thing we do in this area of our lives. And then there's also politics and sports and family and everything's very compartmentalized. And it's very difficult for us to, you know, quote unquote, live as a Christian. I mean, I hear, um, non-denominational Protestants a lot of times say it's very difficult to know when to bring this up. Should I, you know, tell someone at the supermarket that I'm Christian or, you know, how do I do Christianity in my day-to-day -day life? Right. And, um, a lot of this is just because there isn't a holistic worldview per se outside of the Orthodox phronema in the Christian world, right? The Rome, maybe you could say the Roman Catholic world had something like this, maybe prior to the middle ages. Um, Vatican one certainly attempted to <laughs> double down on some things. Uh, and then Vatican two essentially just turned the Roman Catholic church into Protestantism. Um, and then at the core of Protestantism is really separation of church and state, uh, the individual rights of man, natural law, natural right theory, really anything that comes out of like the classical liberal enlightenment, it really has its basis in, uh, first Roman Catholic medieval thought. And then it finds its fullest fruition in 
the Protestant Reformation and then the Enlightenment, right? Which is a natural outgrowth of those of those processes. And so we see in modern times the um specifically the Protestant tradition, this attempt to sort of instinctively go back mentally, emotionally, spiritually, go back to something bigger. And this is sort of a Protestant trend. <laughs> we can go back to Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Melanchthon and all these guys. And we could just say, well, they they could have just become Orthodox, right? It would have saved a lot of trouble from my point of view, and maybe from your point of view, if you agree, would have saved the whole Western world a lot of trouble if the reformers, instead of reforming, had just left Rome and joined the Orthodox Church. You just think how many millions and millions and millions of people's lives could be saved. Um, and also, we probably could have avoided, maybe avoided classical liberalism and the whole product of the Enlightenment itself, which is this, you know, fracturing, fracturing, uh, fragmenting even the Christian tradition and separating it into applicable boxes. So when you when you hear like uh, the classical, I mean, sorry, the um, neo-Calvinist tradition of like political or legal reform, there's always this sort of need to impart Christian beliefs into it, but still keep it legally separate from the church itself, right? Because you can't have, you have to have a, a secular government, a state that protects justice, right? But doesn't uh, become a theonomy or theocracy really is, is the kind of idea. Then, of course, you have straight up theocracy, <laughs> right? Uh, theonomy types um, within that tradition, too. So there isn't like you can't agree on anything in the Reformed tradition and the Protestant tradition. Everybody has got to. It's sort of like the secular tradition, right, where there is no agreed upon worldview, except that kind of ideas in the marketplace of ideas win or lose, depending on which ones get picked up by which people at which time. Um, and so I think you're going to see as we go through this a little bit, how, uh, particular folks within, whether it's Dutch reformed or whatever neo-Calvinist or Calvinist tradition, how there's this sort of instinctive need to re-Christianize or re-baptize or bring back in a, a, a quote unquote holistic worldview of Christianity into the, back into the world. You see this with Van Til's presuppositionalism and the gentleman we're going to talk about today um, which we haven't talked about before, but I think it's going to be really cool for you guys. And that's uh, Herman uh, Duyverd. So Her Herman, H-E-R-M-A-N, and Duyverd is a, a Dutch name. It's D-O-O-Y-E-W-E-E-R-D. So it's, it's spelled kind of like du ye weird But Duyverd is the way that you say it, uh, at least the best way I could say it, not being Dutch. Um, so we're going to talk about him. And I'll explain a little bit why in a minute. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Philip Sherrard, who um, you guys may know because he was part of the team that translated our uh, modern four volumes of the Philokalia before he passed away with um, uh, Callisto Swear and somebody else whose name I can't remember. I apologize, but we'll we'll pull it up here. I think G.E. G. Palmer, G.E. Palmer. I'm sorry. So the three of them. And then the book that we're going to be looking at here is going to be uh, Christianity Liniments of a Sacred Tradition by Philip Sherrard, foreword by Timothy Callisto Swear. Um, I'm going to read just chapter one. It's about 25 pages or so and pretty easy to get through type, so it shouldn't take very long. But what I want to try to demonstrate here is how you have uh, helpful pieces within the Western Christian tradition that are going to illuminate parts of things that orthodoxy sort of inherently has within the phronema right and and why are we doing this it's to show that there there at least appears to from a philosophical vantage point appears to be a default state to um, a lot of western christians where if they think deeply enough about something they kind of end up saying orthodox stuff but they don't come to the orthodox church well a lot of them do Right. A lot of the people we listen to, the clergy we listen to on podcasts come from the reform tradition. So we obviously have that right there. But we don't hear a lot about the philosophy and the theology of it's mostly sorry Calvinists, sorry Protestants, sorry Lutheran, right? That's like, but it's never very rarely do we get these folks explaining the tradition um, to us because I think ultimately they realize that if you're do if you're going to liturgy every Sunday, if you're participating in the life of your church community, if you're participating in the body of Christ and taking communion, right, the Eucharist, that you don't need all this philosophical baggage, 
I totally agree you don't, right? There's no real need for you to listen to anything I'm saying here, right? I'm just laying things out in case it's helpful for you. It might not be. It might be harmful for you, in which case, please stop listening and go do something else. But if you find this helpful, um, try to understand where I'm coming from. It's just a different angle from which we can help folks ex uh, understand certain topics if we just keep explaining them in different ways over and over and over again. So uh, Herman Duyverd is um, basically developed a neo-Calvinist philosophy, and he calls it reformational philosophy. And I'm sure you can imagine why, right? <laughs> Uh, it stresses the so uh, sovereignty of God over reality. God is sovereign as creator and sustainer revealed in creation, sovereign as uh, redeemer in Christ revealed in scripture, right? So sounds good so far. Sounds orthodox, right? Um, this would be, I guess, similar to Van Til. Uh, all our arguments start from scripture and then we work our way down from natural revelation and revelation and special revelation to everything else that naturally follows. Now, do you ever um, disagree with Van Til on this? He he didn't he wasn't someone to start with theology first. He would start with philosophy first. But um, and so they had a little bit of a disagreement where the starting point was. That's neither here nor there to the reason I want to bring him up. But I'm gonna I'm gonna read some stuff on him real quick in his life, and then we'll get to um, what's called the cosmonomic idea. Uh, and the cosmonomic idea is going to be essentially. Um, Duyverd's way of explaining worldviews and paradigms, essentially, right? And a, a lot of what he's going to do with this concerns political theory, legal theory, uh, social hegemony, things like that, that, that aren't terribly conducive to what we're trying to explore here. So I'm going to essentially pick out of him what is helpful for us and then leave the rest of it over there. Right? We're not going to become neo-Calvinists. We're not going to adopt reformational philosophy the same way that if we use uh, presuppositional apologetics as Orthodox Christians, we are not becoming Vantillians. We are not Bonsonites. Right? We can use language that's helpful and appropriate it to the Orthodox perspective in Phronema so that it helps explain uh, sometimes difficult concepts that if we can grasp them, will help us be better Orthodox Christians. Um, like I said, maybe this is for you or maybe this isn't for you. It's totally fine. It will also help, I think, in um, discussions with non-believers, humanists, secular, athe uh, secular humanists, atheists, people like that, I think, um, in trying to get them to further understand their worldview um, as being incoherent, right? And if we are to engage in such dialogue with an unbeliever, we want to be comfortable enough in our worldview <laughs> Right to be able to um, not just talk them off the ledge of an uh, incomprehensible paradigm, but also be able to substitute one that actually works in harmony with reality. And that's what uh, Duyverd is going to essentially try to do here. So um, I think what what makes him important is uh, not only because did he demonstrate to the Reformed tradition in the Western theological philosophical world the possibility. Uh, of a Christian approach to philosophy and science, but also he developed and applied it to the area of work that was his own, which is the area of law, the legal field. Um, other people have taken him up and applied him to math and chemistry and biology, psychology, whatever. Uh, that's neither here nor there. I think you're going to see as we get into it why it's easy to um, import certain aspects of him onto other fields. Uh, you, you will see that this isn't, ne this isn't necessary within the orthodox phronema because this is all self-contained in the system, right? You don't need an orthodox theologian or ph philosopher to pop up in the early 1900s or late 1800s and talk about church and state or uh, legalism and, the, and uh, government versus small societal structures you don't need all that because it's all inherently self-contained, right? So let me go ahead and pull this up. We'll do a little bit of reading off the um, off the screen here. Me... Uh, okay. All right, so this page calls this the cosmonymic idea, but it's actually the cosmonomic idea. I don't, 
don't know why they spelled it that way. Maybe it was written in um, it was written in Dutch, so it could be <laughs> written written either way. I'm not I'm not sure. I hadn't noticed that actually until I just pulled this up. But um, so you guys could see that, right? Political legal thought. Yeah. So we'll do a little background here. Um, Erman Duyverd, 1894 to 1977, was born in Amsterdam where he spent almost all of his life as a student and scholar. He grew up in the neo-Calvinist circle, strongly influenced by Abraham Kuyper, the highly influ influential churchman, journalist, political leader, and educator who founded the Free University of Amsterdam, edited a newspaper, organized Europe's first Christian democratic political party. Um, this was actually against, I believe it was against communists, um, if I remember correctly, the anti-revolutionary party, or it could have, maybe it was against the, um, like the idea of the French Revolution, like those folks, but it's been a while since I've, thought about Abraham Kuyper. Maybe we can get into him in a future uh, future discussion. Uh, and he served as the Prime Minister of the Netherlands from um, 1901 to 1904. So Kuyper is known in North America primarily through his stone lectures at Princeton and through his influence at institutions of the Christian Reformed Church and, Christ and Reformed Church of America. So a, a serious student and musician, Duyverd, completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at Free University, wrote his doctoral dissertation in 1917 on the role of the cabinet in Dutch constitutional law. Sounds incredibly intriguing, right? After that, for six years, he served in local and national government posts. Uh, and then in The Hague, in 1922, he accepted appointment as assistant director of the Kuiper Institute, which had just been founded in The Hague as the policy research center for the anti-revolutionary party. Four years later, he became professor of law at Free University, where he served until his retirement in 1965. Um, and then he did a bunch of other stuff here, right? So from the beginning of his research and writing at the Kuiper Institute on the crisis of modern political and legal thought, Duyverd began to move in the direction of developing a comprehensive Christian philosophy as the necessary foundation for legal and political science. Duyverd realized early on the most important questions of any special science, including the social sciences, are, quote, consciously or unconsciously answered in terms of underlying philosophical systems. As a result, Duyverd's career from that time, the early 1920s, had two related but distinct points of orientation. First, the development of a general Christian philosophy, and second, the testing of that philosophy by a careful consideration of theoretic questions in the special sciences. Um, so let's get into what that means. As Duyverd puts it, for the special jural science, the entire method of theoretical concept formation is dependent upon the philosophical ground idea from which it takes its point of departure. He goes on to explain by ground idea, right? Ground, like ground coffee, ground idea. Do you ever means the overarching or comprehensive idea of reality with which one starts when abstracting particular fields or modes of that reality for special study. An adequate conception of law, for example, can never be achieved without an idea of how the legal or journal aspects of reality coheres with all other aspects. So what he's explaining here is just another way of conceptualizing worldview paradigm phronema. Ronoma is a bigger word than worldview and paradigm, but for the sake of this, let's just roll with that for now. So he's saying everything is dependent upon the philosophic ground idea. And the ground idea is the part from which the entire system has its launching point. Without the ground idea, there is nothing to philosophically justify the rest of the movement, right? So for example, um, in order to work out, there must be a gym, gym equipment, your ability to move your limbs up and down and back and forth, right? Right. You must be able to move them in specific patterns. And then, of course, the muscle tears, and then you have to fill the muscle up with protein so it heals and with rest and rehabilitation, um, the proper nutrients, you get stronger and grow and get bigger, right? So within this whole paradigm, there has to be a bunch of things that are assumed to be the case. The ground idea is going to be... Um, for all intents and purposes, the way we're going to appropriate it here is going to be like the first principle, right? The unmoved mover, that type, right? Uh, now, he's going to differentiate this from God specifically, which is going to differentiate his philosophy from Van Til or Bonson, where they, they're starting very much in the same place as an Orthodox Christian from Revelation specifically. Um, and in Orthodoxy, it is the... Uh, the monarchia of the father and uh, John of Damascus makes this very important in exact exposition, right? Where we start our order of theology is always with God, the father, right? It's not with what we have in common with pagans, like um, Aquinas taught or 
you know, the, the unmoved mover uh, thought thinking itself of Aristotle or something like that. But for Duyaverd, the ground idea is essentially that basic presupposition where everything else has to rely on it. Uh, moreover, according, according to Duyaverd, at the root of every basic ground idea is a, quote, religious basic motive or orienting drive that directs one's life and thought. The great turning point in my thought, Duyaverd explains, was marked by the discovery of the religious root of thought itself. Consequently, as he continued his philosophical quest, Duyaverd realized that the long-standing Western assumption of the autonomy and neutrality of philosophical thought had to be recognized as a fundamental error because all thought is dependent on pre-theoretical assumptions and religi religious basic commitments. Henceforth, he taught in a conscious, critical fashion to ground all of his philosophical work in the Christian ground idea, which he summarizes with the phrase, creation, fall, redemption. Creation, fall, redemption. Three words, three stages. This is important. CFR, creation, fall, redemption, right? With, these th with the three words of that phrase, Doya Verde encapsulates the basic idea that the whole of the cosmos is God's creation, ordered by God's laws and norms towards an end that will be realized only through God's judgment of human sin and redemption of the cosmos in Jesus Christ. For this, uh, for this reason, Doya Verde refers to his philosophy as the philosophy of the cosmonomic idea. Okay. Now you can see here how this wording, if we place it in an orthodox con context, makes sense, right? It sounds like presup. It sounds like transcendental, excuse me, argumentation. It's just his approach is tactically a little bit different. Just like Van Thiel's is a little bit different, just like Boston's a little bit different. So again, we're not trying to become followers of Duyaverd here. Just like we're not followers of Van Thiel or followers of Bonson or any of these guys. But we are using what is helpful in what they are talking about. And then we're going to show and demonstrate through the understanding of these ideas that are worded in different ways, more of how the orthodox phronema works. And this will maybe not just help uh, budding orthodox Christians, but help people who are either unbelievers or who are Christian aside from capital O orthodoxy. Um, perhaps they will also understand because we're, we're talking to them in, in words that are commonplace, right? In their um, philosophical day-to-day -day life, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Another point from which to gain entrance to Duya Verde's philosophy is by starting with the ordinary everyday experience we have of the various relationships, associations, organizations, and institutes of society. Without much critical thought, we can notice that these relationships and organizations are of different types and exhibit different types of responsibility. In order to give a proper account of those diverse responsibilities, however, one must engage in a normative task. And this is where critical reflection and argument become un unavoidable. The, qu the reason is that every serious attempt to account for social diversity either answers or takes for granted answers to questions such as, what makes social diversity possible? What is its origin? What is its source? What holds it together? And what is the meaning of human life in society in the first place? And by social diversity, he's not talking about like DEI and ESG. He's talking about when you go out into the world, you see different institutions, you see gas stations, you see churches, you see schools, you see government organizations, you see gyms, you see fast food restaurants, right? You see social diversity and different people doing different things. The, the um, division of labor, right, is sort of what he's what he's talking about. The, and then what is the meaning of human life in society in the first place? You could see how from a reformed epistemological point of view, from a Calvinist point of view, this would be something you would want to try to figure out, right? Because there is no continuous thought in the Protestant tradition. It is constantly fracturing, fractaling all over the place as new thinkers deal with um, new modes of thinking, right? So in every generation, there is an unbelieving precept of the world that interferes with the Christian life, whether it's communism, right? Just whatever, secularism, commercialism, Amazon, <laughs> Right. There's going to be every generation is going to encounter some new challenge to the Christian worldview. And so in Protestantism, there, there isn't much to uh, hold together the lineaments, right? The lineaments of tradition that we're going to talk about with, with Sherard 
here in a minute. There's just kind of like overarching concepts, uh, free will or no free will, uh, predestination or no predestination, um, the five solas, sola fide, faith alone, right? Just kind of abstract concepts that, that sort of perhaps give a tentative glue to a 500 year tradition of thought, right? That is ultimately all over the place, right? So you can see how somebody like Duya Baird, you know, com coming of age and talking kind of what during the depression, essentially, right? Um, is going to be looking at all of these things in the context without really having much to go on, right? He's going to be kind of stepping in and going, well, you know, I have, I've learned all this theology and philosophy stuff. Uh, yeah, there were some great thinkers in the past, but right now we're dealing with this issue. And so we have to come up with something to deal with this issue. Um, so it goes on to say here, <clears throat> another point from which to gain entrance to Doya Verde's philosophy is by starting with the ordinary everyday experience we have of the various relationships, associations, organizations, and institutions of society. Without much critical thought, we can notice that these relationships and organizations are of different types and exhibit different kinds of responsibility. In order to give a proper account of those diverse responsibilities, however, one must engage in a normative task. And this is where critical reflection and argument becomes unavoidable. So we're going to go to, in the course of his work, as just mentioned, he became convinced that the differences among various accounts of reality are due most importantly to differing ground ideas arising from different, quote, religious ground motives or, quote, religious basic motives, which encompass and influence human life in its entirety. These deep orienting drives shape the basic assumptions and ideas that thinkers have about the origin, diversity, and coherence of the cosmos. What is he saying? He's saying there are religious ground motives or religious basic motives that are his ground ideas that different people hold as kind of their foundational principle of their worldview. Does this sound familiar? This is basically pre-sub, right? Now, don't worry about the fact that he's coming at this from a different angle. We want to keep it grounded in what we're using it for, right? He is essentially saying the worldview paradigm that we've been talking about just in different terms with different cliches, Re religious ground motive, religious basic motive, um, ground ideas, things like that, right? But he says these deep orienting drives shape the basic assumptions and ideas that thinkers have about the origin, diversity, and coherence of the cosmos, of the entire thing, right? If you have the overarching religious basic motive, the ground idea that everything's supernatural and everything that's in quote unquote historical religion is nonsense fairy tales, then it is going to be impossible for you to see the world without assuming that to be the case. And so those assumptions will drive every other idea you have. And even if you are, if you claim to be agnostic in the truest sense of the word, right? Or open to the possibility of there being some higher intelligence or whatnot, that's going to also influence how you do your work whether it's your day-to-day -day life, how you interact with other humans, your friends, your family, your coworkers, or it could be how you interact in your job, how you interact in your, um, your religious life or your scientific life. If you're, if you're a scientist studying the heavens or studying microbiology or studying quantum entanglement, right? Quantum field theory. And you believe in God and the guy next to you doesn't believe in God. Do you think you're going to have the same view? <laughs> of what you're studying. I mean, you might be seeing the same thing. We would agree with that. You're not going to see reality differently, probably at least empirical reality, right? But your assumptions and, and your presuppositions about what that means are going to change. And we are saying it is impossible to avoid this, right? Even if you had never grown up hearing the word God, philosophy, presupposition, any of this technical terminology junk, right? Just the fact that you had experienced things and had memories of life, let's say for 40 years, and then somebody sticks you in a lab and says, uh, go study this. It's going to be impossible for you to turn all of that off and just have this tabula rasa, John Locke blank slate version of reality where nothing you've ever experienced before in history is going to involve itself in what you've determined to be the case studying this thing. 
right? Does that make sense? Um, and Duya Baird is just saying the same thing here in different words. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, his philosophy, therefore, whether starting from within the problems of the theoretical thought or starting from questions about everyday experience is rooted in the conviction that the cosmos, that is everything that exists, is God's creation. On this basis, he presumes that every scientific and philosophical account of reality must necessarily depend on the creation's order and conditions, regardless of whether a thinker believes this to be true. Thus, if those seeking to account for reality hold fast to contrary assumptions and or ignore the lawful and normative boundaries of creation, their arguments will inevitably get caught in antinomy, antinomies. By an antinomy, Doya Baird means an unresolvable dilemma that a theorist accepts as a given, as inherent in the very foundations of reality, including the foundations of human life and society. However, from Doya Baird's point of view, the cosmic order cannot be antinomic because it is God's well-ordered creation. In fact, it is the very order of creation that drives misguided antinomos thinking into its unresolvable dilemmas, antinomies. Thus, the only account of reality that can answer the questions raised above without collapsing in antinomies is one that is grounded in biblical creation order assumptions and proceeds by carefully heeding the creation's integral order. Moreover, only such an account will be able to offer an adequate explanation of why other accounts get caught in ant antinomies. Thus, Zoyaverd's philosophy of the cosmonomic idea entails the method of antinomy, the method of searching out, illuminating, and overcoming such. And this is a crucial part of his method, method, methodical investigation of the character of diverse religious basic motives and ground ideas that he calls the transcendental critical method. So what does all this stuff mean? <laughs> He's essentially saying that we're all going to have a worldview. We're all going to have a worldview with a first principle, right? He is saying that if you don't have the Christian worldview, now it's difficult to ascertain from reading him. And I've read three of Dilly Verde's books and numerous articles about him. Um, it's very difficult to glean from him exactly what his theology is other than to just describe him as a neo-Calvinist. <laughs> um, and that means sort of bringing Calvinism into a more modern post enlightenment materialist scientific worldview ish, I guess. Um, so we have to remember when we're talking about worldviews, we are trying to apply this to our worldview, which we are saying we can define much better than Doya Verdes, right? So pretend in your, in your head, Doya Verdes is an Orthodox Christian talking about this. We are taking his ideas and we are applying it properly. Just like um, Van Til and Bonson talk about, uh, you know, reality can't, reality exists whether you believe it does or not, right? Whether you are a realist, an idealist, an empiricist, a rationalist, whatever you decide you are, reality, everybody would agree, reality is something. Either it's 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 total matrix, right, made up, unbelievable, or literally, uh, when I'm looking at this mouse, then what I see and touch and smell and right feel uh, is actually the mouse. Like it's a one to one, what I see and what is relationship. And idealist would say, well, no, we, it's all really in the mind. And then we can't really impart that one to one onto the mouse. Um, and empiricist says, all we know is what we're seeing. And it doesn't really matter <laughs> what happens in the mind. Right. But uh, as Orthodox Christians, we are realists. We are, we are, we don't believe the world is a matrix. We don't believe this is, we're like plugged into a computer. Um, we believe that when I have a cell phone in my hand, that's actually a cell phone, right? So we are ult ultimate, ultimately realists. Um, and then we follow sacred tradition, which comes from scripture uh, and the church, right? So again, this is just another way of saying he's postulating, and we would agree with this, that without the Christian paradigm, there is no way to properly justify or account for reality at all. Now, this doesn't mean that you get if you get in your car and you drive to Burger King, uh, get a number three Whopper meal, uh, eat it in the car and drive home and take your dog out for but all these things aren't going to happen and they're not going to you're not going to have to dissect it philosophically <laughs> for it to make sense. And that's because reality is reality. Now, if you decide that you're going to operate on the basis of an unbelieving paradigm or an atheist paradigm or the flying spaghetti monster paradigm, you're going to not comport with reality. 
And by not comporting properly with reality one to one, it is going to throw everything in you, body, mind, spirit, soul, totally out of whack. Right? The same way that trying to drive backwards on an interstate would throw you out of whack or trying to think of a square circle will throw you out of whack. <laughs> right? Trying to picture water that has a different chemical component than H2O, call it XYZ and still be water. It's difficult to fathom these things, but we get so habitually caught up in routine that we oftentimes just go through our entire lives from birth to death, just doing stuff and never thinking about how does this affect us? How does it affect other people? Are we truly in line with order or are we moving in a chaotic way, a disorderly way through an orderly existence? Right. And then people will oftentimes look and they will say, well, if there's a God, he's a psychopath because look at nature, nature dies and you know, maggots eat corpses and wolves tear up gazelles and People go to war and the God of the universe is a sociopath, right? And of course, if you don't have the doctrine of the fall, right, then you don't have a way of explaining this. And you're going to constantly move as if a fallen world is reality as it was uh, created to be and not what was the result of sinful action on the part of man. And you see how those two, now the atheist is going to say that's silly, right? We're not... <laughs> I understand their point of view is going to be, that's ridiculous. Why would I ever No, It's just Darwin's right. And their survival, of the fittest and things adapt over time. And you know, the best we can do to not end up in a state of nature, like Thomas Hobbes says, or Locke or Rousseau or any of these characters is to, uh, you know, formulate a little, uh, group of people who through, um, you know, di different, um, different jobs and, and responsibilities, right. Are going to delineate how the society works and hopefully they are uh, as little involved in our day-to-day -day goings on as possible. And, uh, therefore we have peace and everybody gets along and, and we'll be good. Right. And, and we're saying if that's how you're living life, you're not living it properly. Right now, of course, the atheist is going to disagree with this. And our job is to number one, point out the flaws in their own system, which you've heard me talk about a million times, how you can't actually, can't actually know anything in their system. And they'll say, well, that's not possible because I know stuff. And we'll say, yes, you know stuff because our system is correct. <laughs> and so by, by natural like um, extent, things are going to go well for you if you just go a little with the flow for more, more or less, right? But as, as soon as you start to get deeper, as soon as you start to go deep into how things work, how humans work in various social settings, right? Your worldview is going to start taking precedent. Does anybody remember 2020? We know at least there was at least two worldviews going on in 2020, right? The people who were pro all the things and the people who were not, right? And it was very clear to a lot of us who were coming out of the libertarian tradition, the ultimately the classical liberal tradition, um, that these two groups of people, the pro coof and the nothing burger group, right? <laughs> that those two pe those two groups of people were having a very difficult time coexisting in the same world together, right? And I heard many people who are not necessarily God-fearing Christians, but just libertarian-minded all over social media saying, I can't live in a society with these other people. We see the world two completely different ways. How can we possibly coexist together? Retain that idea because that's exactly where we're going. We're just going on a much larger scale, right? And you heard me say three, four years ago, Christianity and libertarianism are not compatible. Well, in the reformed tradition, they are compatible. And that's why Doya Verde here and a lot of these other neo-Calvinist political and legal thinkers are going to apply a lot of this to what we would consider to be like um, the city of man as opposed to the city of God. And they're going to try to create structures and institutions on this earth because they don't have the church. The church is the institution for us as Orthodox Christians. But because that doesn't exist in the Protestant world, there has to be some other institution. For the Roman Catholic, it's the papacy, right? And for the Protestant, 
every individual Christian is a pope, right? It's a democratized papalism. And then because that's the case, everybody has their own ideas, whatever. There's going to be this natural need to sort of blend with the world and Christianize it. But in the back of their head, they're constantly thinking, and most of them, because there are Christian nationalist types for sure, right? Uh, the Gab people, the Andrew Torbas of the world, these people, Andrew Iskers, these people, right? But for within the neo-Calvinist tradition, it's going to be very much separation of church and state. And this is the idea that the state is there to kind of provide justice, but it's not going to Christianize anybody. Um, and I think this comes from, honestly, not wanting to be subjugated themselves. And so it's saying, well, I don't, as a Christian, I don't want to be uh, subjugated, held down, told what to do, uh, thrown in jail for, for being Christian. Therefore, I'm not going to persecute anybody else. So this kind of Lockean idea of natural law, quote unquote, right, um, comes kind of out of that tradition, right? And so you see a lot of these modern day reformed people trying to sort of traverse that, that area. Um, now, if they had the church, this wouldn't be an issue for them because what happens in man-made structures is ultimately irrelevant. And while freedom of speech, freedom of religion is beneficial to Christians, it is not a distinctly Christian idea. Right. And this is why I say libertarianism and Christianity do not work together. They could technically work in the same place at the same time, but that does not make them compatible in general. Okay. So uh, we're going to jump down here because a, a lot of what he's going to talk about in the next seven or eight paragraphs here is going to be all legal theory. And I think I just summed most of that up. <laughs> we don't need Dewey Verd's political theory. So let me just scroll down here a little bit. Give me one second. Right. So <clears throat> when we let's go back to talking about ground motives here, because uh, if we start getting into his legal and juridical and political <laughs> aspects, we'll be here all day. And it's not even that interesting, really. I mean, there are there are political thinkers in our in our sphere. Um, I know Erickson loves political theory. Uh, Picanones talks about political theory a bunch. Um, and as a now uh, Roman Catholic, again, he would probably be very interested in a lot of this stuff. But just to jump to ground motives here real quick. Um, ground motives were mentioned at the start, and they're essentially religious in nature. Um, they reflect what we most fundamentally believe about the nature of reality. And while not every single human being is going to hold to all of these at any given time, we sort of see these uh, eras or epochs where particular forms can uh, guide theoretical thinking over the course of time. And so Deuterberg, uh talks about the um, the Greek ground motive, which is matter form. And then the Hebrew, eventually Christian, excuse me, creation, fall, redemption, which we already talked about. And then the medieval Roman Catholic scholastic nature, grace distinction, and then the modern Renaissance enlightenment determinism versus freedom. So we have Greek matter versus form. We have Hebrew early Christian creation, fall, redemption. We have medieval Roman Catholic scholastic nature, grace, and the modern determinism freedom. Right. So matter form, we can talk about a little bit like Plato uh, says that the, the ideal forms are up here somewhere. We can't see them and everything down here that's in the realm of the many is a, sort of a, a reflection of that divine idea, that that perfect form in a sub perfect way. Right. Uh, creation, fall, redemption is obviously the story of the, the Bible, the Christian story. Man was created, man fell, man will be redeemed through Jesus Christ. Right. Um, the nature grace distinction develops in the scholastic medieval Roman Catholic world. And then, of course, this eventually let, leads itself to determinism versus freedom. The idea that all things are uh, essentially happening to you versus I have free will. I can do what I want and uh, nature can't stop me kind of idea. Right. So you'll notice three of the four of these are dialectics, matter, form, nature, grace, determinism, freedom, dialectics. The only one that's tri tri sorry, trifold <laughs> is creation, fall, redemption. Right. Notice the Trinity apparent and the lack of dialectics. And that's why I thought this actually transposes very well into the Orthodox world. We're looking at the obliteration of dialectics and the, re the resolution of the paradox of the one and the many in the Orthodox Christian God, in Yahweh, in the Trinity. Right. So he notes here 
uh, all but the second are dualistic in nature and thus result in tempor temporal reality being split into and disintegrated, right? Nature grace came from an attempt to merge the first two, leading to all sorts of oppressions and distortions, which led people eventually to one of two reactions against it. One was the Reformation, which sought to recover some of the pure creation fall redemption motive. The other was the Renaissance, Renaissance which assuming the problem lay with the God part, <laughs> sought to remove it from the grace element, thus producing freedom in the modern ground motive, right? To have a dualistic ground motive actually goes against the laws of the whole aspect, right? So we cannot set aside these laws. They'll have an effect, a, a long-term and deep effect. Um, and then it, it either will or will not allow us to be open to God, depending on which worldview allows human contact with God. It is also going to be the worldview that most deeply affects and influences our functioning and other aspects. So essentially what we're trying to do here as Orthodox Christians is um, understand that, and I'm not sure if Julia Baird understood, I'm going to guess he probably wasn't familiar with the essence energies distinction, but it is just another way that Orthodox Christianity does what Western Christianity doesn't allow itself to, because Western Christianity had the essence energies distinction and then decided that it didn't need it anymore <laughs> and then went off the rails causing all of these dualistic issues that doy bird points out but he doesn't have the essence energies distinction to bring back in he doesn't have it so he's trying to find a way to make god active in the world and his only way to do this is to sort of like just bring god philosophically into something and say and use presup to have god act in that way but ultimately, we don't need that because the essence energies distinction means that God is always acting. The logos is always acting through the logoi in the world at all times through the divine energies, the uncreated energies, right? So, um, let me go back to this real quick and just find there's a part on medieval Aristotelian and medieval stuff in here that I wanted to talk real quick about. Before we move on. Um, okay. So in Doya Baird's interpretation, medieval Christian philosophy, here we are right here, culminating in the work of Aquinas, attempted a problematic synthesis of Christian and Greco-Roman cosmonomic ideas, just as a great deal of modern Christian philosophy has tried to synthesize Christian and modern humanist cosmon cosmonic ideas, right? So does this make sense to everybody now, right? So the idea of like the modern, uh, you know, the local church with the, the Skittles flag and the, 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 the chick ministers and everybody's welcome. And we all sing Kumbaya. Right. And then we, uh, maybe we do or don't eat like a, a Twix bar and pretend it's the Eucharist. Right. <laughs> That's the kind of synthesizing of humanist cos cosmonomic ideas with Christian ideas. Um, and I believe we talked about this when I had, uh, uh, Robert hand on, I believe we talked a little bit about some of that uh, Schleiermacher, some of these guys and how they kind of wanted to bring back Christianity, but make it palatable to the secular humanists. Um, but that really, really what he's saying, do you here is saying, and I would agree with the problem really starts with the medieval uh, Catholic scholastics, which attempt to integrate platonic or Aristotelian, mostly Aristotelian ideas into Christianity where they don't need to be right. They don't need to be there. We don't need Aristotle, right? to tell us anything about Christianity, but for Aquinas, he did. And so we start doing all these weird dialectical synthesis stuff, and then we end up in a big mess. So uh, he says Aquinas, for example, certainly presumed that the God of the Bible is the creator of all things and that all modes of reality and the diversity of human responsibilities hold together by the providence of God in the unity of creation. On the other hand, Aquinas also adopted a great deal of the classical worldview as the framework with which to explain human nature, law, and the diversity of society. This was problematic because the cosmos for the Greek philosophers is explained <clears throat> is explained ultimately in terms of the dualistic dialectic of form and matter. Form and matter, even when both are thought of as created by God, cannot yield a non-antinomic idea of creation's coherence and integral dependence on God. This is especially significant for Aquinas' understanding of reason, law, and nature, where Duyverd sees at least a partial expression of rational reductionism. Aquinas, as Doya Verde interprets him, sometimes blurs the boundary between God and creation which, with respect to both law and reason and tends to reduce or condense all modal normativity to rationality. Natural law is the sharing in eternal law by intelligent creatures. The relationships between men and 
of men to God are subject to the dictates of natural law. The creation's social diversity coheres in rational lawfulness. By contrast, Stoyevert argues, the biblical understanding of creation is incompatible with a falling back upon the Aristotelian Thomistic definition of the lex naturalis, or natural law. For this latter proceeds from the religious form matter motive of Greek thought, and therefore necessarily conflicts with the biblical conception. The speculative idea of the lex eterna provides the form foundation for the speculative lex nat naturalis with its teleological order of substantial forms. In this construction, human reason thinks it can prescribe what is law to God. And in the final analysis, the Aristotelian conception of the world order is deified because in the idea of the lex eterna, it is identified with the rational essence of God. If you've heard um, anybody talk for length about the essence energies distinction and how uh, the lack of this would lead to a weird um, monistic interpretation of a triune God, this is what they're talking about. And I believe that Zoya Verde here makes a very astute, uh, very rational, orthodox take on uh, what is happening in Roman Catholic scholasticism. When you, when you remove the ability for God to operate in the world, you need two things. You, you need an earthly person to do it, right? To stand in. And you're going to have to figure out how God can both be present in his creation and not reduce to parts. And the whole idea of the simplicity of God is that you cannot reduce God to parts. This is divine simplicity, but absolute divine simplicity negates things like the incarnation or the ability for there to be a trinity, <laughs> right? Now, of course, Aquinas didn't deny the trinity or the incarnation, but what ends up happening, and this is what Doyle is pointing out, you have inconsistencies and incomprehensibility that ends up affecting over the course of time, right, the rest of the church in the West. And so you have some Protestants today who are reacting against this and not reacting against this. And some uh, JT Bridges, for example, who's been on the show, and we talked about uh, ID and um, intelligent design and, and Darwinism and such. He's a, um, a Thomist, a Protestant Thomist. But I've talked to Roman Catholics who are not Thomists. I've talked to Protestants who aren't Thomists. Obviously, an Orthodox person wouldn't be a Thomist, right? Um, and that's not to deny natural law. It's just to say we have different ideas of where the natural law comes from. And those two or three or four different definitions or four or five different worldviews are going to change the societal structures on which the worldview is based. And so when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, you look at the Protestant world, and you look at the Orthodox Christian world, you see three groups that all claim to be Christian and all operate in the world completely different and separate from one another, right? It's easier to see this when you remove it from the atheist standpoint. But the atheist, the, sec the secular humanist, right, is also operating in their own worldview as well. And of course, everybody thinks their worldview is right until it's challenged and then <laughs> they either double down or they learn, right? So... I think uh, somebody wants to talk more about ground motives. We can do it on like another episode or something, but I'll just, I'll link um, dooy.info slash ground.motives.html is one of them. And then this one here is uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. So I'll link both of these in the show notes. Um, all right, now we're going to get into the second half of the show. We're going to talk about Philip Sherrard and I'm going to read the first chapter of Liniments of a Sacred Tradition. And I think you're going to see by the end of that how this all uh, coalesces into hopefully a coherent podcast episode that is trying to bring together a bunch of what seem like divergent views into a coherent, um, understandable system uh, for you guys out there. And of course, please like, share, comment, uh, subscribe so you get the notifications. So when these come out, you can share, comment, and like them and such, right? In the comments, I'd like to know uh, what part of this you would like to explore more of or what you think um, would be helpful to get into because I don't want to come on here and do, uh, you know, one minute clips explaining precept. I want to not treat the audience um, like children. I want to treat people like adults. Uh, we want to foster a community of adults who want to learn and grow um, ultimately in the church. Uh, and if I can help get you to a church, if I can help introduce you to clergy, um, then I feel like my job's done, right? That's all I can do. Uh, in the meantime, you may want to 
you may be listening to other podcasts or reading books and you just have questions and you want to conceptual help help you want help conceptualizing things um hopefully this is helping you do that and, and we're going to keep saying things in as many different ways as we can until it starts to click so now that we've talked about uh someone who partially agrees with our oral view we're going to talk about mr philip sherrard i'm just going to pull up here his orthodox wiki page and we'll read off of that and then we'll uh we'll get into the book so orthodox wiki All right philip sherrard was a poet translator theologian and interpreter of the orthodox tradition a prolific writer on theological and philosophical themes he addressed the origin of the social and spiritual crisis he believed was occurring in the developed world and specifically exploring modern attitudes toward the environment from an orthodox perspective i mentioned to you earlier that with timothy ware and g.e palmer he produced a complete translation of the philokalia uh four of the five volumes um and i, I there is a fifth volume that was released i believe in two translations within the last year or two obviously uh he's passed away um so i'm not sure exactly who it was <laughs> that did the fifth that translated the fifth volume, but we have the four up there on, if you see them on the top shelf next to the, the Philip Schaff set there. Um, I highly recommend reading those with the spiritual father or getting some clerical guidance on them so that they make sense that very deep, intricate things that you don't want to just, I mean, it can be dangerous to read things like that. It could also be a waste of time if you don't have the proper context. So you don't want to read it, have it harm you. You don't want to read it and have it do nothing, right? So things like the Philokalia should require some guidance from folks who are well-trained in the aspect of something that deep in, the in theology, right? Um, he was born in 1922 in Oxford. He had, uh, family had many connections with the literary world. His mother had been a member of Rupert Brooks' circle before the First World War. His half-sister was married to the nephew of Virginia Woolf, and he was educated at Dauncey School and at Peterhouse, Cambridge. Um, the cultural and traditional way of life that pertained in the country made a profound impression on him in the early fifties. And again, in the late fifties, he served as assistant director of the British school of archeology span at Athens in 1956, his doctoral thesis on the Greek poets, Salomos, Palamas, Kalfi, uh, and a bunch of other guys here was published in the marble threshing floor. Aha, in the same year in Athens, he was baptized into the Orthodox church. He made frequent pilgrimages to the Holy mountain. Mount Athos and became profoundly imbued with the prayer and silence of Orthodox Christianity. His book on Athos was first published in 1960, the title Athos, the mountain of silence. His writings often interpret the cultural background of Greek poetry and life through the spiritual wealth of the Orthodox tradition. Um, and if you, if you pick this book up and I highly recommend it guys, uh, really, really important uh, book to be reading here. It, the introduction is by Timothy Ware, Callistus Ware. And he gives a very beautiful romantic portrait of Philip Sherrard that all the Wikipedia pages in the world couldn't duplicate this, the beautiful sentiment um, that uh, that Kalisos Ware brings to that. So <clears throat> now that we have an idea of uh, presup, we have an idea of the uh, transcendental argument, we have an idea of uh, ground motives, religious ground motives, we have an idea of different worldviews and paradigms and how they interact with the world, we want to more specifically hone in on, on the orthodox paradigm. So let's get started here. The book is Christianity, Liniments of a Sacred Tradition by Philip Sherrard, foreword by Callisto Swear. And skipping over the introduction, which read that on your own, it's, it's just a beautiful memoir for, for the man. Um, and the entire book itself is just going to give you, you know, it's, it's about 250 pages, you can get through it in a couple of days. It's it's a very easy typeface to read. You see here, um, it might be if you're not trying to do a you know, doctoral dissertation on presup, it's going to give you the phronema and worldview um, and a commentary. It was interesting. I made a note here that chapter one reminded me of like an Orthodox Christian take on something like industrial society and its future which I know sounds like the craziest thing to like white Kaczynski and Philip Sherrard, but it, how, you know, two people can look at the same evil that's being created in the world and have 
the same critique and two totally different prescriptions for how to handle the same description. Um, I just thought it was a fantastic thing to kind of note the similarity between the critique and then the, just the completely different opposing prescriptions of how to deal with these things. So we're going to read here. It starts on the meaning and necessity of sacred tradition. Over the last decade, it has become only too clear that our subscription to the dominantly materialistic and mechanistic philosophies which determine the course of what we call the natural sciences and their ramifications in the technological, industrial, political, economic, educational, and practically every other sphere has led us to build a type of society that desecrates and mutilates human and natural life in all its aspects. At the same time, it has become equally clear that the values embedded in these philosophies are utterly useless in helping us to resolve any of the problems which our subscription to them has created for us. We cannot prevent the pro proliferation of armed conflict and mass murder. While we still regard the production and sale of deadly weapons not as an inhuman form of criminality and hypocrisy, but as something in which nation states and their human labor force can quite legitimately engage in to support their economies. Nor can the fight against pollution and mass starvation or anything else have any chance of success, so long as the means through which it is waged involve the same, quote, logic of production, the same free market selling techniques, and the same ruthless competitive exploitation that have produced these ecological and social catastrophes in the first place. Worse than this, we realize that to speak as we do of our culture, when what we mean is the indulgence of the few in which a majority takes no part in and has little interest in is merely to play with the words in an effort to hide the lack of any genuine creative vitality. In short, it is not going too far to say that our subscription to these philosophies has reduced us to a state of spiritual, mental, and cultural degradation for which it would be hard to find a parallel in the history of mankind. What does this signify? Or to ask the same question in another way, what if the values which have led us to produce our present state of affairs are clearly so disastrous, what values are we to put in their place? What is it that distinguishes cultures that retain a grasp on life which, appear, which we appear to have lost? Is there some element present in what we acknowledge to be the great civilizations of the world which is not present, or at least not cogently present, in our own latter-day civilization, if we can even still call it that? If we are to judge from the art of these civilizations, we are bound to say there is. For whether we speak of the art of the ancient Greek world, or the art of India, or of the Islamic world, or of our own Christian world down to the time of the Renaissance, it is not of a religious art that we are speaking. It is an art, that is to say, dedicated to the expression or revelation of realities that are more than human or natural, <clears throat> realities that we denote by the word spiritual. It is an art which presupposes that there is a realm of what we may call spiritual archetypes or of eternal harmony that constitutes the underlying structure of the natural or physical world. And that is the source of life and the activity on which this world depends. Thus, the art of these civilizations is dedicated to revealing and to making as co coherent as possible for us the nature of the spiritual realities that lie at the root of and that manifest themselves in human and other life. It is to aid man in what is his central concern, that is to everything else subordinate, his search for communion and harmony with these realities. For when what is to be realized and experienced through such communion and harmony is regarded as the source of all vitality and significance, of all inspiration and beauty, as that which in fact alone is truly real, then not to make that the central concern of life would be to show a curious lack of judgment. And of that concern, art is a vital aspect. It is a vital part of the communion and harmony which it supports. If it stirs the feelings, it is yet meant to convey a knowledge. If it makes use of what is natural and human, it is yet the interpretation, the science, of what is supranatural and more than human. Basically then, what has been lost from our culture, or the element that is missing from it, is the recognition and knowledge of the realities of the spiritual realm, and hence of communion with them. That is to say, it is the religious sense and understanding of life. For although we may speak of archetypes and metaphysical principles, and may acknowledge that these are the shaping forces of the art of mankind's great civilizations, it is quite impossible for most of us to know what is meant by them, except in an abstract and theoretical way. It is possible for most of us to experience, with all the intensity which it must possess, a reality that is more than human. The religious myths that underline the culture in which we recognize the presence of some quality that now eludes us are, for the people of such cultures, not mere human inventions, but symbols and images that make possible a direct and constant intercourse with the universal principles of life. And if these people occupy themselves so much with such images and symbols that they not only fill their rites and their places of worship with them, 
but also paint them on their pottery, weave them into their clothing, sing of them in their songs, dance in obedience to them, lay their fields out after their pattern, score them on rock and tree, and even cut them into their own flesh. That is because they recognize how their very existence, as well as the existence of the culture of which, as a living organism, each of them is part, depends on that intercourse. Yes, you. that was an entire paragraph in one sentence. Just so I, <laughs> That's a beautiful way to write, man. It reminds me of like the constant clauses you can always stick on the end of Greek and you can kind of have this like, like 45 page sentence, <laughs> but absolutely beautiful writing, man. Um, and yet it is impossible to interest the vast majority of us in any of these images and symbols. A whole language of the soul, a whole spiritual science has been lost to us. And what this means is that to all intents and purposes, we are ignorant, not only of these things and symbols, but also of the reality of the archetypes of which they are the expression. Such ignorance is now endemic to our education, our science, our culture, to the pseudo knowledge of the learned, the pseudo skepticism of the unlearned, to the whole bewildering phantasmagoria that typifies our disinherited world. This might not be of great importance if the reality in question were merely one alternative among many possible levels of reality each of an equal or neutral value. But when, what is at issue is a matter of existence, our life or death, and when what has been lost is the capacity to commune with the sources on which that existence depends, then there is a consequence for us which cannot be dismissed. If the values according to which we have formed the modern world are those which have led to this state of affairs, it is surely important that there should be some reassessment, and if it's not too late, some fundamental change of mind. What kind of reassessment and what kind of change of mind? Here, as a preliminary, we must affirm a distinction in modes of understanding and vision, and in the levels of reality to which they relate, whose recognition is essential if we are to grasp first why we have been reduced to such spiritual poverty, and second, what are the prerequisite, prerequisites for escaping from it? We can introduce this distinction by way of Heraclitus. According to Heraclitus, that's a, a pre-Socratic philosopher, um, Usually, if you're doing a study on the pre-Socratics, he's going to be one of the ones that comes up pretty quick. And um, I believe he's the one who says all things are fire, and he's also big on flux and change. Um, let's see if I'm right about it. Pretty sure that's exactly right. <laughs> According to Heraclitus, oh, by the way, also Heraclitus, that that idea, um, I think, ties a little bit into, there's there's a book up there on the shelf uh, about uh, Gemistus Plethon and the end of the Byzantine Empire and hit the kind of resurrection of Heraclitian ideas in Plethon that eventually lead to Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza's uh, metaphysics. Um, and so just keep the name Heraclitus in mind. We may get into that sometime. Um, and uh, the, the idea is this may have come to uh, Greece through Solon, who was actually a statesman, Greek statesman, who spent some time in Egypt. And he may have imported Egyptian metaphysics into the Greek culture, um, thereby influencing, strangely enough, uh, pantheists like Spinoza 2000 years later. So just something to keep in mind there. If anybody wants to tug on that string, uh, according to Heraclitus, although we all possess a common logos, meaning a common principle of divine and creative wisdom, yet most people live, most people live as if they had a private understanding of things. In other words, there is a knowledge or wisdom that is supra individual, which all people in their right mind possess. And there is also a purely individual notion of things according to which people live when they are not in their right mind. This distinction is taken up and developed by Plato. He speaks of that which is always real and has no becoming and of that which is always becoming and is never real. All right, so always real, no becoming, and then also which is always becoming and never real. So forms, right? The one, the many, the forms, the real, right? The first is the world of invisible and defined ideas. That must not be thought of as static abstractions or concepts, but as dynamic energies by which all that is visible and changing in, is the external form or appearance. The second is precisely the visible and changing world, which considered in itself has no absolute reality since it is but the effect or outward manifestation of what is invisible and changeless. To consider the second part from its relationship to the first is much the same as to consider the shadow without reference to the subject which casts it. The shadow, of course, has a certain reality, but it would be extremely foolish to pretend that it possesses this reality in its own right and independent of the subject. To these two levels of reality, the one intelligible and the other sensible, correspond the two types of knowledge which Heraclitus indicates, the axiomatic and universal knowledge of first principles and 
the ever-shifting and conjectural knowledge of contingencies. Right? One, many. Okay? The first, having to do with that which ever is and does not begin, is what Plato calls truth. While the second, concerned with, with that which begins and perishes, is a matter of opinion. In fact, the second is not real knowledge at all. Listen here. As Plato points out, such knowledge about things that change will itself change as the things change. And if this change of knowledge from one thing to another is always going on, at the time of change, there will be no knowledge at all, and thus no one who knows and nothing to be known. Let's try that again, <laughs> all right? As Plato points out, such knowledge about things that change will itself change as the things change. Right? So our knowledge about things in flux will change as the flux changes. Right? And if this change of knowledge from one thing to another is always happening, right? At the time of change, there will be no knowledge at all because change is always happening. And thus no one who knows and nothing to be known. So it's another way of saying if this is the case in which our empirical reality is the reality and there is no higher reality, then we can't actually know anything. So I think we've demonstrated the last two weeks about seven different ways of saying this exact concept, right? Without something transcendent, there is no reality that is comprehensible at all because everything is completely subjective. There is no knowledge possible. There is no knower possible. You cannot know that you even know anything in that world, right? Uh, hence, all true knowledge is concerned with what is colorless, formless, and intangible. Not such knowledge as has a beginning and varies as, as it is associated with one or another of the things that we now call quote-unquote realities, but that which is really real. Christian authors in the same way speak of these different levels of reality and of the two types of knowledge that typify them. For that truly hath a being which remains unchangeably, writes St. Augustine. And again, the intellectual cognition of eternal things is one thing, the rational cognition of temporal things is another. Eternal things are what St. Augustine calls elsewhere principal forms or stable and immovable essences of things. Not themselves being formed, they are eternal and always in the same state as contained in the intelligence of God. They are not born, they do not perish. But it is by them that is formed all which can be born and perish, and all which is born and perishes. According to St. Maximus the Confessor, the multiplicity the multiplicity of these uh, causal forms, logi, he calls them, L-O-G-O-I, is rooted in the one divine and universal intelligence, that is to say, in the divine and universal logos. Logos, logi. Okay? Each created thing is defined in respect both of its essence and of its becoming by its own particular causal form, which is itself embraced by this divine intelligence or logos. Or, as St. Dionys Dionysius the Areopagite puts it, God confers on all things his vision, participation, and resemblance according to the divine idea of each being. Thus, all things are in various and multiple ways imminent in the divine. This gives the world its essential unity, its diversities and differentiations being rooted in the same divine intelligence. In other words, there is an imminent reflection of the intelligible in the sensible and of the sensible in the intelligible. The intelligible being up here and the sensible being here, the empirical. The intelligible world contains the causes of and is mirrored in the sensible world, while each sensible thing is a symbol of and is Gnostically present in the intelligible world. He doesn't mean Gnostic with a capital G here. He means just knowable, right? Gnostic. So the intelligible world consists of the causes of and is mirrored in the sensible world, while each sensible thing is a symbol of and is Gnostically present in the intelligible world. Though what is sense through what is sensible, we may perceive what is intelligible provided we have cleansed our organs of perception. You may hear the concept of the noose working its way into Sherard's writing here. But any real knowledge of the sensible realities must depend entirely on our knowledge of their intelligible or spiritual essences. Indeed, it may even be said that he who only sees what is sensible does not really see anything at all. Sorry, empiricists. The error then is to imagine that sensible things are the only reality, or can be known without reference to intelligible things, that in fact we can really understand the shadow without reference to the subject casting it. This is what we imagine when the light of divine knowledge is eclipsed in us, 
and we are left with only such knowledge as we think our individual and natural minds can adduce from sensible things. Since, as Aristotle remarks, the realm of the sense of a negligible part of the whole, and that part, the realm of the sense is a negligible part of the whole, and that part cannot be known apart from the knowledge of the whole itself. It follows that such knowledge as we think we derive from it when we attempt to know it without knowledge of the whole will simply be conjectural. It is worthwhile to consider in more detail just what is evolved in the loss of divine knowledge, since it is crucial. There we go. I'll turn a little light on so I can see. <clears throat> it is crucial to the thesis of this chapter. The first point to stress is the distinction in man of two faculties, the spiritual intellect and natural reason. The spiritual intellect is that which the Christian authors refer to above all call the God-like faculty in man, the divine spirit breathed into us in the act of our creation, the consummation of the divine image in which we are created and that which in the deepest part of ourselves we are. It is that mysterious eye of the soul through which St. Augustine saw the light that never changes. And it may be defined as St. Bernard defines it as the soul's true unerring intuition, the unhesitating apprehension of truth. It differs from the reason in that it has its seat not in the head but in the heart, and differs again from the reason in that it is not simply a classifying faculty, but is the mirror of the divine intelligence which fills it with the knowledge in the light of which it perceives the underlying spiritual identity of visible material things. This knowledge in the light of, in the light of which the spiritual intellect knows external objects embraces the creative ideas, the archetypal logi or causes of which visible things are the manifestation. What is seen in such an idea is not an abstraction or a concept or an analogy drawn from external object through the activity of the reason. It is on the contrary, the spiritual energy issuing from the divine, according to which a thing receive, receives its existence, an energy manifesting itself in visible form. The spiritual intellect thus knows all visible things through knowing their causes, through a participation in the very ideas or energies of which they are the manifestation. It is capable of a direct perception of the intelligible and inner or real nature of everything that is, of which the sensible form is but the outward manifestation. Its way of knowing is through the spiritual experience and intuition and not through concepts and discursive reasoning. To quote, say, to quote Saint Maximus again, the immediate experience of a thing suppresses the concept which represents this thing. I call experience knowledge an act which takes place beyond all concept. I call intuition the participation itself in the object known at a level above all thought. The second point which must be emphasized is that this spiritual intellect cannot be operative or awakened in us. We cannot share in its activity, for example, unless we first of all free ourselves from alien hostile attachments and persuasions, false and self-centered ideas and habits, and submit ourselves to what surpasses us to the source of light and of the divine ideas which can only then illuminate our mind. When the mind is cut off from this source, when it has lost its roots in the heart, our experience and intuition of what always is, really and unchangeably, is lost, and all that is possible are purely conjectural and hypothetical theories about things. We are left with a kind of pseudo-knowledge, not with knowledge itself. Which is to say, really, that we don't, we might say we know stuff, but we don't really know anything about stuff. We just know that there is stuff. And that's about the best we can do. That's essentially what he's saying here. In Without the light, the divine light. At the same time, we cease to know ourselves, since it is only through the intellect that we may perceive the center and substance of what we are. And with this now being darkened in us, we can have only a peripheral and accidental opinion about ourselves. In fact, before we can know anything in the real sense, we must first of all know ourselves. For unless we know that, through the intellect's intuition of the spiritual and creative energies that make us what we are, we can never know the energies or causes by which everything else is made. That is why the condition of any real knowledge is our purification of ourselves to the point at which our intelligence becomes again receptive to the light of the divine intelligence, to the grace of God, the point at which the mind, the satellite of the heart, is brought back to the heart, where it is truly rooted in the source of light and fully vivified by its power. The intellect then reawakened in us orients us toward the divine and the universal. When it has once again become transparent to the divine intelligence, then we see and know ourselves and see and know everything else in the pure mirror of the in intellect. We are thus able to refer ourselves and each thing to our and its supra-individual origin 
the divine logos himself. When we lose this contact with and participation in the logos, then closed within our individual selfhood and the ego consciousness that goes with it, we refer all things to ourselves as end, regard ourselves as self-sufficient beings. Created free in God, we seek to be free in our own pro proprium, which means in our own ego. We commit a kind of apostasy, a denial of what is superior to ourselves, the sin of pride, which turns rapidly to greed. Our mind then, preferring its own opinion to the common and universal logos, desires to use all for its own purpose and enjoyment. Realizing its power over material things and turned towards them, our mind first engenders in itself their sensations, then, by a process of abstraction, forms images and concepts of them. A sort of mental fornication takes place in which the mind debauches and loses, loses itself among a welter of such concepts and images, which it divides, multiplies, contracts, and larges, orders, disarranges ad infinitum. All of this is the natural and inevitable consequence of our loss of participation in the divine intelligence. No longer able to realize our dependence on what surpasses us, we now regard ourselves as independent and self-sufficient. We want all for ourselves, and having at our disposal only the material world, we turn to that and use it, not as a means through which we can cont uh, contemplate and glorify the divinity, but as something we can exploit to satisfy all of the needs and greeds of our inflated and egocentric selves. It is possible to trace through these three crises of modern Europe, which we call the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Age of Enlightenment, this movement of a mind which is broken with reality of a spiritual or metaphysical order and has more and more asserted its own self-sufficiency. Beginning with a denial, already explicit in the works of some of the scholastic philosophers, that through delect, delect, that through direct intellectual vision, we can perceive the divine source of our own existence, and hence the divine source of all created things. The first stage of this movement is the assertion that the human mind can acquire a type of knowledge that's valid without reference to divine knowledge. Thus, a purely relative and individual faculty usurps the position of the divinely ordered intellect. By the time of Descartes, this process is complete. The human mind is said to be quite capable of formulating a valid type of knowledge, not only without reference to divine knowledge, but also without reference to the sensible world and its phenomena. The human mind becomes the self-sufficient arbiter of knowledge. Finally, the human mind itself, as part of this downward movement, increasingly takes its cue not from the ideas that have their source in the universal logos, but from the dicta invented by whatever philosopher or group of philosophers happens to hold the stage. Dicta that becomes ever more mechanical and banal as the human mind disowns its divine inheritance. There is no longer any question of truth in an absolute sense, but only of theories which are no more than the conceptualized fantasies of minds that have lost their links with any genuine reality, whether physical or metaphysical. In these circumstances, it is inevitable that these theories are as numerous and change as rapidly as the individuals who make them. With the intellect obscured and the reason chained more and more to the service of material ends, it is not surprising that the final stage of this mental aberration is an attack on the human mind itself, not in the name of that which is superior to it, but in an appeal to the infraconscious and subjective worlds of pseudo-mysticisms through sensation, psychology, occultism, and much else of an equally anti-spiritual nature. What afflicts us then, the cause of our confusion, anxiety, guilt, despair, is first of all a disorientation of our thought, a disease of the mind. It began with a defection of the mind and like a slow poison has spread through the whole of life. The fundamental hierarchies of our being are overturned and those primal relationships which link us to the sources of energy and permit the full deployment of our possibilities have been destroyed. We have reduced ourselves to a fraction of what we are and our idea of the world to a mere caricature. Full of an immense futility and despicable cunning, we go on extending our conquest and distributing our wealth over the deserts of the material world. But we have no strength to face and grapple with those realities in communion with which alone our existence achieves significance. Superbly equipped to fight each other, we are defenseless against the terrible punishment decreed for those who refuse their maker and savior that tribute of love, that gesture of confidence, without which no one can live. Such a decline into unreality and meaninglessness is inescapable once the forms and values that condition a society become disassociated from their archetypes in the spiritual realm, or rather, 
when the thought and actions of that society's members are no longer based on a religious sense and understanding of life and its corresponding practices. And this is but another way of saying that such a decline is inescapable when once the thought and actions of all the members of a particular society are no longer determined above all by their allegiance and adherence to the norms of a sacred tradition. When these norms cease to be effective for the majority of its members, society simply disintegrates. In other words, the integrity of a society and the communal effectiveness of a sacred tradition are inseparable. I'll say it again. In other words, the integrity of a society and the communal effectiveness of a sacred tradition are inseparable. When these norms cease to be effective for the majority of its members, society simply disintegrates. Now, anybody who has eyes to see and ears to hear and remembers 2020 Keep in mind those last two sentences and the last 10, 11 pages I just read. We are seeing, we, we got to witness, you know, I, I was born in 82. I grew up in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, other than 9-11, which affected me drastically because I was, I ended up being in the military as a result of 9-11. I had just gotten out of high school. Um, for the most part, what was happening was over there. I mean, 9-11 was, I mean, I remember people blasting born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen in long car caravans down my, you know, streets of my hometown, which by the way, is a super ironic song to be playing if you're trying to be a, a patriot, but <laughs> goes to show you how lost people were in the early 2000s. Um, but for the most part, you know, we remember 9-11, but like people got on with their lives. It wasn't like a four year sustained, right? It was the attack. And then we went over and we bombed the shit out of a bunch of countries and destabilized an entire region worse than it already was. A lot of people became libertarians during this time, right wingers, such. And then the coup 2020 happens, right? The demic happens. And we watched, at least from our point of view, from my point of view, we watched society crumble. We were no longer in peacetime. We were in wartime. We were we had our personal lives, our businesses, our homes, our families, our loved ones affected by the control of the few in a way that we had never experienced in our lifetimes. I'm going to be 42 this year. The only time I'd ever experienced something like that. Granted, on the grand scale of tyranny, right, the mass genocide in this country over, you know, manifest destiny or other countries or other world wars, whatever, like great injustices that have occurred over time. I wouldn't say the coup is very high on the list, but for those of us who live in a relatively protected Western society, uh, it was a huge invasion of privacy that none of us had witnessed on a scale like that. And it happened like a zombie apocalypse, like overnight. Now, thankfully, it wasn't an actual zombie apocalypse because <laughs> uh, clearly our elites uh, and our systems proved that I think pretty concretely that they were not equipped to deal with such a thing. So thank goodness it turned out to be nothing, but uh, much as the, um, you know, a dorky, dorky, small guy who's got a kind of posture and stand up and try to be a tough dude, our state used it as a big W to push forward a lot of its agenda that it wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And now we see even Orthodox Christian clergy calling out the WEF, right? Uh, Klaus Schwab, Agenda 2030, all of these things. And we start to really see a breakdown of society, a society that in a nominal sense anyway is based on quote unquote Judeo-Christian values. Right? I would say the decline of Christendom happened a long time ago and that we are actually in a post-democratic age. Uh, that's maybe a conversation for another podcast, but um, people have asked me like, when do I think the United States will cease to be a concept? And I, I said, I don't think it's been a concept in decades. Um, that we're actually witnessing a fall right now. Um, you know, we're not being invaded by the Mongols or something, <laughs> or the you know the Visigoths. But you can see, if you again, if you have eyes to see, you can see the disintegration of a society just by the fact that there are no governing principles anymore. And the governing principles that people would hold on to, I suppose, have this kind of weird libertarian versus anti-libertarian kind of super secular feel to it, which ultimately reduces to nothing. Ultimately, the, these ideas are just ideas. They're human constructs and human constructs can only work in a society so long. They're not eternal. They're not unchanging. They're changing by definition. 
right? So anyone holding on to the classical liberal or libertarian viewpoint versus the libertine viewpoint versus the coercive viewpoint, right? Versus the state has to protect everybody viewpoint. These are all secular ideologies that are doomed to fail because there is nothing eternal about the myth. There is nothing about it that resonates in anybody deeply. And it may only work during peacetime when people don't have to consider the ramifications of these projects. But once they start to interfere in our lives, we realize how hollow and empty they are. And you saw in 2020, everyone running back to tradition, whatever tradition it was. And that's exactly what Sherard is talking about here. Why is this the case? Sacred tradition in the highest sense consists in the preservation and handing down of a method of contemplation. A method of contemplation in its turn is what makes it possible for us to transcend our bodily, psychic, and merely ratiocinative life to go beyond our sensations, feelings, and argumentative logic in order to attain through intellectual vision, a knowledge of and communion with the divine, the source of all things. A corollary of this is that it permits us to perceive physical things as symbols of what lies beyond them. It permits us to perceive the hidden workings of reality, the spiritual essences that all things enshrine and of which they are the visible and tangible manifestations. Surely it might be said this is something we can achieve for ourselves, if we feel so inclined, without the need of any tradition with its superstructure of metaphysical or theological theory and its often elaborate ritual. We simply just have to meditate or pray even or to take certain mind-altering drugs. We can expand our consciousness by purely natural means, means within our own natural scope, without resorting to means that claim to be, quote, supernatural and sacred. It is true that in our ordinary human state, everyone has some concept of the nature or reality or meaning of existence. We also have some idea of our own potentialities and qualities and of how we can best cultivate them. In addition, something in us, we call it our conscience maybe, indicates to us whether we are acting rightly or wrongly. Although to judge by the actions in which human beings are often too, are too often engaged in this capacity is frequently in a basins or at least ineffective. But in spite of this, there are profound and crucial aspects of our nature, as well as profound and crucial potentialities within us, of which we would remain ignorant were we not told about them. These aspects and potentialities are above all connected with our relationship to the divine and with the knowledge of what constitutes human perfection and of how we may attain it. The nature of this relationship, and hence the knowledge of what constitutes our perfection and of how we may attain it, are matters of which we cannot be aware unless God reveals them to us in a form that we are capable of grasping. Without such revelation, we cannot know what human perfection consists in or what our true potentialities are, and still less can we know how to actualize them. For our human potentialities go infinitely beyond the parameters of any kind of perfection we can visualize as possessing on our own account or that can be actualized without divine intervention and guidance. As a uh, quick you know, rejoinder to or uh, a response to the atheist, um, keep in mind that uh, when Abraham spoke with God, God did not reveal quantum field theory to Abraham, or I guess Abram at that time, right? He revealed to somebody in the Bronze Age what a Bronze Age person would understand. When Moses wrote the Pentateuch, wrote the Torah, he wrote it in a way that people living at that time and subsequently future times would be able to understand unequivocally. Unless, of course, you're a Protestant, in which case nobody agrees with anybody, <laughs> right? But in words and terminology, they would understand. So people are like, why didn't God uh, talk about the planet Pluto and Neptune and Uranus uh, and the uh, quantum gravitational fields and space time? That would have made a lot. It would have made everything so much easier if he just talked about that in the Bible. I think Sherard is to the point here why that's, you know, you're looking for God to talk to you in a way that you want it to be explained. He's talking in a way he wants you to understand it. So your job, your job is to adapt to God and the order, the created order, not try to make the created order adapt to you, not try to fit God into your box, right? Oh, I'm going to take God down, Tower of Babel, right? I'm going to build up. I'm going to take God down. I'm going to turn him in. I'm going to idolize. I'm going to turn him into something that I need, right? I'm going to make him in the image of me. I'm going to use him like magic to get what I want in the world not conform myself to what God asks me to be, right? <clears throat> Even the absolutely crucial fact on which hang, as it were, all the laws and the prophets, 
that in addition to our ratiocinative faculty, we possess a faculty of vision, the spiritual intellect, upon the actualization of which depends our capacity to attain a direct and experiential knowledge of the reality of things, is something of which we remain ignorant unless we are told about it. And nor can we know unless we are told about it how we can actualize this faculty. Revelation is the only means at our disposal through which we can grasp the full scope of such potentialities and receive guidance as to how we can cultivate them. It delineates and describes reality in modes that we can grasp. To reject revelation is thus to reject the possibility of attaining the perfection of the human state. It is to ensure that we fail to fulfill our role as human beings. Conversely, to the extent to which we conform to the norms provided by revelation, we will be led to actualize the potentialities of our nature since it is only through such actualization that we can integrate the otherwise uncoordinated and anarchic impulses and proclivities of our being, it follows that our failure to conform to the norms provided by revelation means that we live in a state of disintegration and life-crippling frustration, a state that will be reflected in the state of the society of which we are members. Without roots in the common ground of our being, in the universal logos, we are condemned to an individualism that is desolate as it is self-destructive. The norms of revelation are those that constitute the norms of religion or of sacred tradition. Thus, what has just been said with respect to the norms of revelation applies equally to the norms of sacred tradition. To the extent to which we conform to the norms provided by sacred tradition, we will not only become aware of our full human potentialities, but will also receive the understanding and guidance necessary for their actualization. Conversely, to the extent to which we reject sacred tradition and fail to conform to its norms, we will remain in a state of disintegration, frustration, and misery, a state which will be projected in our society. It is only through the surpassing of our self-centered individualism and the ego consciousness that goes with it that we can live in harmony, not only with our own selves, but with all other living things, human and nat natural as well. Such a surpassing of our self-centered individualism does not entail the elimination of our individuality as such. It entails the reuniting of our individuality with its true center and subject, its personal divine archetype, by virtue of which we constitute a person and not simply an individual. A sacred tradition, then, will possess two main aspects. The first is what we may call the Gnostic as aspect, aspect, in that it pertains to the knowledge of what constitutes the fully realized and perfected human state, the relationship with the divine that such a state presupposes, and the corresponding relationship between God, ourselves, and the natural world that we describe as cosmology. So one, knowledge. The second aspect concerns the guidance and means whereby we can actualize the full potentialities of the human state, which at the same time requires that we actualize our proper relationship with God, other people, and with every other living thing in the natural world. This aspect may be called the aspect of spiritual practice or method through which we can attain the state of contemplation and glorification in which the purpose of sacred tradition is consummated. So one, knowledge, two, method. Before there can be any question of sacred tradition in the authentic sense of the words, these two seemingly independent aspects of gnosis and method have to be in such close conjunction and interrelationship that to all intents and purposes, they constitute two aspects of a single undivided reality. There cannot be a sacred tradition when all the emphasis or greater part of it is placed simply on gathering information about the spiritual life just as there cannot be a sacred tradition when all the emphasis or the major part of it is placed on following blindly an external dis discipline of ritual or aesthetic or moral action. One can say that all metaphysical or theological or philosophical doctrine that does not have its purpose and does not culminate in experiential spiritual illumination is vain speculation, while all searching for mystical experience not grounded in sound doctrine is likely to end in disaster and disintegration. The two aspects of gnosis and spiritual practice, wisdom and method, have to go hand in hand and to balance each other. This is an important point to stress from the start, possibly under the influence of the modern scientific mentality, according to which knowledge is something we can acquire by learning, and certainly without going through any ritual aesthetic purification, we have developed the habit of thinking the same applies where spiritual knowledge is concerned. That is to say, we tend to think that by studying the works of the inspired spiritual masters and interpreters, we can acquire spiritual knowledge and that all the external aspects of spiritual tradition, for example, its ritual and aesthetic practice are somehow secondary and may not be important at all. And so can be dispensed with. So what he's actually talking about here 
is what folks like myself might often get accused of, and that is intellectualizing the tradition. And I will just, because you're going to get people who bring this up, like you're going to get some interlocutor is going to come and accuse us of being too intellectual. This is an after the fact thought here, right? We don't, we don't want to intellectualize. We want to participate. We want to be in church with the community during lit liturgy at Vespers, at Matins, part of the community worshiping, right? The creator worshiping the divine logos, being part of the community, participating in the liturgy. That's what we need to be doing. This, all of this is just hopefully helping people to get there, right? That's the most important part. <clears throat> this is not the case at all, obviously. <laughs> Both are of equal importance. Knowledge unaccompanied by corresponding ritual or aesthetic practice will remain simply abstract knowledge, just as ritual or aesthetic practice unaccompanied by its corresponding intellectual component. The understanding of the inner meaning is, like, meaning is likely to remain unproductive. An anti-traditional or anti-spiritual mentality is always at work in the attitude which tends to play down the importance of the whole formal ritual and aesthetic and ceremonial side of religion. The aspect of wisdom in a sacred tradition is represented by what we call doctrine. Of course, all religions have a doctrine. In fact, it is precisely because of the doctrine of one that one religion may seem at odds with the doctrine of another religion, that there have been so many religious wars and such animosity between people holding different religious beliefs. This has led many people to question the value of doctrine altogether, which is an attitude that complements that of those who question the value of religious practice. Yet doctrine, for reasons we have seen, is an essential element of every sacred tradition and cannot be displaced. As to why there are diversities of doctrine among the sacred traditions, this is a theme that will be discussed in a later chapter. I will also just point out myself here that uh, this is also inescapable. <laughs> and one of the things that we realized, you know, four or five years ago now, four years ago, was uh, that you will people will always worship something. They'll poo-poo the idea of a creator god or quote unquote institutionalized religion, right? But they'll worship the state or they'll worship freedom and liberty, or they'll worship themselves, or they'll worship stuff, right? Material stuff, money, manna, mammon, sorry, right? There'll always be something. You no, know, we might not worship, uh, you know, Zeus, Aphrodite, right? Uh, Ares, but we worship power, lust, money, avarice, right? So these ideas are always within the consciousness of a society, the collective consciousness of a society, and it is impossible to not ultimately worship that. And when you worship something, you live within it. It becomes part of you. It's a feedback loop of participation, feedback, participation, feedback. This is going to happen regardless of whether you call yourself an atheist, secular, humanist, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Buddhist, right? Scientist, materialist, modernist, enlightenedist, whatever, right? It's inevitable. It's inescapable that there will be something that you worship. Not that you bow down to it and move your hands up and down and kiss the ground, right? But that it becomes your life. It becomes the thing you need, you feed off of, you're addicted to, right? And this is inescapable. <clears throat> the first constitutive element of a sacred tradition then is doctrine. Uh, I might also point out doctrine. I mean, the Declaration of Independence, right? The Constitution, the Supreme Court, the separation of church and state. These are all American doctrines, right? The pursuit of happiness, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. American doctrine. Justice is blind. American doctrine, right? Such doctrine enshrines the knowledge imparted by God through revelation, often in the form of a holy book or holy books, and interpreted by the inspired spiritual masters of the tradition concerned. As such it is, in accordance with the strictly etym etymological sense of the word, a metaphysical knowledge, it is concerned with that which is beyond or after physical or natural knowledge. This means that the doctrine of a sacred tradition is also beyond the natural sciences in all their forms. It means that, that it is something that lies together beyond the scope of the modern sciences and of the modern scientific mentality. It is not simply that the modern sciences have so far failed to investigate things that belong to the domain of metaphysics because they have not yet advanced that far, which they will do one day if only they push forward with their investigations. This is not the case at all. 
the domain of metaphysical knowledge consists of that, which by its very nature lies outside of the range of these sciences, and far exceeds in scope all that they can embrace, however far they may push forward with their method of analysis and dissection. In addition to this, the modern sciences are always dependent to some extent upon some form of experimentation, but metaphysical knowledge is essentially that of which no experimental or external investigation of this kind is possible, being beyond physics, metaphysics. It is also beyond experiment, beyond every kind of statistical or mathematical verification or demonstration. Consequently, the scope of every separate science can be extended indefinitely without it ever reaching a point of contact with metaphysical knowledge. This is something of which certain modern scientists who claim that quantum physics, for example, is, quote, approaching the state of Eastern metaphysics appear to be unaware. unaware. They do not appear to realize that by definition, physics cannot be metaphysical, or at least can only become metaphysical by ceasing to be physics. Metaphysical knowledge is supra-rational, intuitive, and it's immediate knowledge. The domain of metaphysical knowledge is the domain of eternal and immutable principles revealed directly by God and apprehended by human beings only when they have attained the state of contemplation or intellectual vision. Such vision is not within the scope of human reason. Sorry, Aquinas. Still less does it have anything in common with intuition, as it is understood by philosophers like Bergson or writers like D.H. Lawrence, for whom intuition is purely instinctual and subconscious faculty that lies beneath the reason and not above it and has its source in impressions received through the body and senses, and in feelings and images around, aroused in us by the experience of our physical being, and our subjective emotional reactions to them. Intellectual vision is, as we have seen, a function that belongs to an organ that is superior to reason. It belongs to a kind of transcendent intellect, which is able to apprehend directly the truths of the spiritual realm. How can we set about realizing that which is beyond the scope of our ordinary or natural faculties? How can we raise ourselves or be raised above our ordinary individual state so that we can attain the experiential vision of transcendent realities, a vision that is by definition supra-individual? How, in other words, can we awaken, awaken and bring into operation the organ of vision through which we can perceive these realities, awaken and bring into operation our spiritual and transcendent intellect? The answer to this question introduces us to the second of those two aspects, which I said, together constitute an integral and authentic sacred tradition the aspects of gnosis and spiritual practice, wisdom and method. Because here what comes into play is a process of initiation into the contemplative state, an initiation which if pursued to its term allows us to actually experience the spiritual realities of which the doctrine has been the gauge and the promise. Initiation or contemplation has as its purpose the actualization of spiritual intellect to the point at which, transcending its own natural powers, it comes to share in the spiritual vision of God himself. God is God because he possesses the spiritual vision of things. To share in this vision, we must ourselves be begotten by God, be born of the Spirit, and become ourselves God-like. Initiation thus leads directly to the consciousness of God, to the merging of our consciousness with God. When this happens, we contemplate God in all things and all things in God, not through the natural vision of our intellect, but because the vision of our intellect is now that which God perceives things. Our organ of vision has become God's organ of vision. Initiation, then, may be said to have two main stages. The first is that whereby we come to grasp our own causal principle, or to become aware of the divine image in ourselves. We come to realize that we are the epiphanic form of a divine archetype. At the same time, we come to realize that each visible reality is the epiphanic form of the divinity. We come to perceive God in all things. This stage of initiation is not achieved by way of exterior action. It is achieved by an ever-deepening process of inner concentration on the part of the intellect operating according to its own impetus and nature, and with the help of imaginative power. It also leads to the limits of what we might call, adopting the terminology of ancient Greek initiatory rites, the lesser mysteries. So far, there is no question of being more than a natural human individual, or of being in an effective possession of a supernatural or divine state. But we will at least have broken free from time and from the apparent succession of things in time, and will be in possession of something which previously we had no knowledge of all at all something that may be called the sense of eternity. Also, and more important, when we have reached this stage and only then, we will be in a position to embark on the second stage of initiation, a stage of the greater mysteries which are characterized by the penetration into states that are supernatural, uncreated, and divine. In this second state of initiation, the intellect transcends the mode of vision it has achieved in the first state, and from seeing God in all things, it comes to see God, see all things in God. This is something that it achieves only through the direct illumination and grace of God himself. So far, looking towards the many or the realm of multiplicity, 
the intellect has come to perceive in each of these things, many things, a spiritual quality or dimension, seeing each as the manifestation of the divine. Now it has to transcend the realm of multiplicity, not by rejecting what it now perceives, but as it were, by calling or gleaning from each visible thing, the spiritual quality it enshrines, and by realizing that these qualities all harmonize with each other and, and are all the flower and growth of one root. Thus, the intellect is led back from the many to the one and sees all things as one in the one from whom all multiplicity derives. And to the degree to which it comes to perceive in things that belong to the natural world, that which transcends this world, it enters the supernatural realm, mirroring the transcendent one. This transcending of the realm of multiplicity is to pass through the angelic states to the realm of pure being and beyond that to a state that can be described only as one of divine darkness and unknowingness the ultimate all-embracing ground of divine potentiality symbolized in sacred tradition by the figure of the eternal feminine. Yet, even when transmuted into this uncreated and infinite state, beings still have a positive and individuated status. To deny individuation in the divine realm is to deny the archetypal theophanic dimension specific to every visible thing. Gnostic contemplation does not consist in proceeding from a visible form to a pure absence of form, or to a pure formlessness in the sense that implies a complete absence of individuation. Such a conclusion would be to posit a conception of the supreme metaphysical essence that is reached by denying that this essence possesses any positive qualities or individuation whatsoever. In other words, that is negatively conditioned. In that case, the divine image of every manifest being ceases to be a theophanic symbol and becomes instead no more than a mere allegory. So basically, we must see individuation in the one that shows itself in the many. We're not trying to escape the individuation. We're not trying to get away from it, right? Which is just to be like really kind of caustic. Um, what essentially like your Eastern mysticism, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, this stuff uh, at its core is really about escape, right? Escape from the endless cycle, escape from death, escape from rebirth right? Samsara, right? Is that the right word? I remember exactly what the word is, but to escape this and transcend and reach Nirvana and reach that, that place. I may have mixed that word up because I was watching the movie, the creator last night. And I think <laughs> that word had something to do with the movie. It was a stupid movie, but anyway, I digress through this inner transmutation in which the contemplative path is consummated. A human being attains precisely the experience of his own theophany. That is his person as the person in and by whom God manifests himself to himself in the ultimate ground of his divinity. It is God's self-determination that, that constitutes this theophany. And it is this theophany that constitutes this human being's individuation. Through that individuation, God reveals himself as God. But God, as he is in that person, in this state, the human being is truly in possession of the plenitude of his possibilities and is perfected. This brings us back to the question that led us to describe the two main stages of the initiatory way. Given that with our own unaided powers, we cannot raise ourselves above the natural individuated state, how can we traverse not only the lesser mysteries, but also the greater mysteries? For to traverse these two stages of initiation does presuppose not only that we grasp the principle of human individuality, but also that we attain states of being above the purely natural state. Initiation is by definition a, quote, second birth, a birth in the spirit. We can no more bring about by ourselves our spiritual birth than we can our biological birth. Briefly, the answer to this question is that if we aspire to initiation, we can only, in fact, enter into the initiatory process on condition that we receive a spiritual influence that bestows on us the capability to do so. The reception of such a spiritual influence is an absolute necessity if we are to be reborn. For such an influence, deriving as it does from a supra-individual and divine source, confers on us a potentiality to go beyond the purely natural individuated state and to attain levels of being that are of a metaphysical order. Just as there can be no spontaneous combustion in the material or corporeal order, there can be no development in the spiritual order without the intervention of a more than human spiritual influence. Even the aptitudes and possibilities included in the natural individual state are no more than materia prima, that is to say a pure potentiality in which there is nothing developed or differentiated for this potentiality to take form and to organize itself, to develop per se, an initial vibration must be communicated to it by spiritual powers. This vibration is the quote, let there be light of the book of Genesis. 
that illuminates chaos. And from the point of view of initiation, this illumination is brought about by the transmission of the spiritual influence of which I have spoken. It is only by virtue of this influence that the possibilities inherent in the human individual are not doomed to remain simply potential, but are given the capacity to develop in the various phases of the initiatory process. If this is true, even where the phrases of the quote, lesser mysteries are concerned, it is doubtly so. It is doubly so where the traversing of the more than individuated states of the greater mysteries are concerned. We are here confronting a most crucial aspect of sacred tradition. For this spiritual influence can be transmitted to the human individual only by means of a ritual, sacramental, or liturgical act, or of ritual acts. Hence, the absolute necessity of rites in the process of spiritual realization. This does not mean that such ritual acts, even provided that they are scrupulously observed, are sufficient in themselves to bring about such a realization. They can only do so if they are imbued with the vital spiritual influence in question. Without such an influence permeating them, they are simply counterfeits lacking any spiritual significance. Rites and sacraments, therefore, are a necessary condition of the transmission of a spiritual influence, but they are not in themselves sufficient to produce the influence. They do not function, that is to say, mechanically or automatically. In order for ritual forms not to be parodies or caricatures, in order for them to serve as a genuine support or vehicle for, for spiritual influence, they have to be instituted by a divine being by divine being and to be operated by those who have received a special consecration, a special authorization, and a qualification to operate them. They have to be operated by those who constitute a sacred or higher attic order and to whom the spiritual influence has itself been transmitted. As what distinguishes an authentic tradition of this kind from a spurious pseudo-traditional counterfeit, and there are a great many of these, two of its indispensable features have already been identified. The first is that it does not owe its origin to any purely individual initiative. And the second is that it validates the idea of a regular and uninterrupted succession of both its rights and of those authorized and qualified to operate them. Further testimonies of its authentic authenticity are to be found in the saints and holy men which it has nourished and in the sacred arts and crafts which have flourished under its aspiration. Moreover, and it is here that the two aspects of tradition, uh, wisdom and method, merge into a single reality, and it is also the guardian and interpreter of the sacred tradition. Such then is the meaning of sacred tradition. As we have seen, its essential features are that it presupposes on the one hand a body of sacred knowledge, and on the other hand a body of sacred rites and practices through the operation of which a spiritual influence is transmitted that alone makes it possible for us to bring about in ourselves those inner transformations in our consciousness and indeed in our, all, in our whole being that put us in effective possession of the truth and that alone make it possible for us to live the truth. These two presuppositions in their turn posit a third, the existence of an organization of however loose a structure through which both the sacred doctrine and the sacred initiatory rites are transmitted chronologically in an authentic, uninterrupted form. One can say that unless these three features co-inhere and are actively present, there is no sacred tradition in the true sense of the word. The actualization of potentialities requires that all sacred traditions call a second birth a birth in the spirit. And how can a being act on itself? And how can a being act by itself on itself before it has been born? This returns us to the question from which we open the main theme of this chapter, the meaning and necessity of a sacred tradition. For we asked, given that the values which have formed and continue to dominate the modern world are those that have brought us to our present impasse and state of dereliction, what reassessment and change of mind are needed in order for us to recover our equilibrium and loss integrity? The initial answer to this question is fairly obvious. It is that unless we reverse the premises of the type of thought and action whose ascendancy in our consciousness has led us to produce the techno-scientific inferno in which we find ourselves, we will not escape the disaster toward which it is inevitably propelling us. For it is quite clear that no amount of taking thought no amount of scheming and deliberation, discussion in conference, is of the slightest use while the fundamental categories within which the mind itself operates remain unchanged. It has to be reorganized that the real question before us is not, as we often like to think, this, that, or the other thing, but only whether we choose submission to the best of what we are, to the divine in us, or whether we do not. The issue is one of freedom, but a freedom to choose between obedience to what is superior or domination by what is inferior. If we cut ourselves off from what is superior 
we automatically fall under the sway of what is inferior. That is the punishment. I'll repeat. The issue is one of freedom, but of freedom to choose between obedience to what is superior or domination by what is inferior. If we cut ourselves off from what is superior, we automatically fall under the sway of what is inferior. That is the punishment. And you'll remember uh, my talk from the last episode where I read the D doc A. Uh, there are only two ways, the way of light and the way of darkness, right? The essential thing to grasp is that the disease, which has its origins in a defection of the mind, can only be cured through a change of mind, i.e. a remaking of ourselves. It cannot be cured in any other terms. If the errors of thought and judgment of which we are now the victims are not corrected, nothing will be saved. And they can be corrected. The gate of salvation is never shut. The divine image in us, which sparks with the vitality of the Logos and is capable of releasing us from the constricting limits of this world and of restoring our spiritual communion, always remains. It is still conscious in us, even if we are not conscious in it. Nothing can injure or destroy the powers which it alone can realize. However radical our defection, it cannot affect what is, what is essential in us. It cannot touch our deepest nature. It can never be more than accidental. Our original nature always remains inviolate. What punishes us, our death even, is but parasitic. It will cease to exist as soon as we cut it from us. And it may be precisely at the point in which the disease is at its worst. And when we have really given ourselves up, that the reaction will begin, and we will seek our cure in the one direction in which it can be found. This brings us to the more definitive answer to the question posed above, to which the initial reply is that we have to reverse the premise of thought and action and of the values they represent, which still dominate our consciousness. For the cure to our present situation cannot consist simply in freeing ourselves from these premises and values. It has been the thesis of this chapter that we can achieve an integrity of being and hence a viable form of human society only provided that we first become aware of our true potentialities as human beings and then pursue a course through life through which we actualize these potentialities in ex, ex, yes, in existent, in existent terms. Yeah, I'll say it again. It has been the thesis of this chapter that we can achieve an integrity of being and hence a viable form of human society only provided that we first become aware of our true potentialities as human beings and then pursue a course of life through which we actualize these potentialities in existential terms. We have further maintained that the only criteria according to which we can distinguish between what we may happen to think we are and that which we are in our essence, as well as those according to which we can distinguish between truth and error, reality and illusion, are the criteria provided by revelation and enshrined in sacred tradition. In other words, there can be no cure for our present situation until our lives, public and private, are once again established on a religious basis, something of which can come only when we live according to the norms of a sacred tradition. This, in its turn, presupposes two other conditions. First, that we possess a sacred tradition according to whose norms we, should we choose to do so, are able to live. And second, that this tradition affirms these norms in a manner consistent with the revelation to which it's tasked to bear witness and implement in such a way that this revelation is an ever-present reality for each succeeding generation. This means that the tradition in question must not, must not lose its essential initiatory character or allow it to be overlaid and compromised by disproportionate concern with secondary and contingent matters. For should it do this, it will cease to operate as the transfiguratory power of every aspect of human and other life. It will, in other words, betray its essential function as well as the revelation from which it derives. So essentially what he's saying here is you can't adulterate the tradition. You have to keep it the way it was handed to you. Otherwise it won't work. You can't try to change it and make it adapt to, to new circumstances. And you basically can't uh, have Vatican II or Vatican I or the Council of Trent or Florence Ferrara, or, right? Once you start changing the thing that it is, it's not going to do the thing anymore. And it's going to be completely anarchic, crazy world, totally chaotic. And no one's going to be able to achieve anything. It will, in other words, betray its essential function as well as the revelation from which it derives. Unless there is a possibility of these two conditions being fulfilled, then there would seem to be no way in which we can even begin to reestablish our lives on a religious basis. This, it scarcely needs to be said, is not simply an academic matter. 
It is a matter that concerns our survival in every sense of the word, spiritual, cultural, physical. For the rot has eaten so deeply into the fibers of our world, has so weakened all the threads of the social fabric, every established bond of authority and institution of family and state, and has so exposed the emptiness of our man-made, man-centered ideas, our illusion of human happiness and prosperity, our calculations of self-help and mutual aid, that everything to which we have been we have been used to look to for support or guidance, if not actually destroyed, is at least so insecure that we can have no confidence in it. Whether we like it or not, we have come to the desolation of reality. We are set down naked beneath the stars. Nothing stands between our poor, forked, famished human condition and the great spiritual principles we have tried for so long not to confront. We know now that we cannot escape and that it's useless to pretend to take refuge in any less absolute predicament. It is also a dangerous predicament, not least because it possesses its own form of exhilaration. Hence, we are set free from so much irrelevance, from so much sheer and ridiculous waste. There is the cage and the doomed vociferous folly of our life within it. And there is the sea of being and the eternal realities. It is a matter of judgment, truth or error, but the stakes are not equal and it will go hard with us or not at all. If what we fail to choose is the universal logos, still as always at the source of the human mind. The chapters that follow are largely concerned with discussing some of the issues in this predicament insofar as these relate to the sacred tradition that has helped shape the cultural world that used to constitute Christendom, the tradition of Christianity. So we're going to stop there. Um, if you guys like the book, I'm, I'm happy to keep reading it in future episodes, but I think we have broken down what we mean by worldviews, paradigms. Um, we have uh, talked about what is missing in the modern world, what some of us gr uh, grasped very quickly back in 20, uh, saw the writing on the wall, and many people ran back to sacred tradition, not just the Orthodox tradition, but many others as well. Um, and those that stayed married to materialism and enlightenment rationalism, uh, secular humanism, those people, ultimately, they're going to be looking for something. And if they're refusing to look outside of their own box, they're going to find it in those principles and they're going to double down on those principles. And those principles are, despite the fact that these individual people may not want them to be this way, going to be the things that destroy society and break apart the bonds. And we already see how atomized society has become, how much we don't want to be around other people or just a certain group of other people. Um, and especially in the Western world, the more money, the more stuff, the more well-being we have, the easier it is for us to have uh, our basic goods dropped on our doorstep by a drone, the less likely we are to seek out these things that fulfill us because what we are fulfilled by is ultimately what is weighing us down. And we've seen how different groups of people from Protestants to Roman Catholics to Orthodox Christians to materialists all attempt to bridge this gap and fix this problem, but how uh, these things cannot operate together. They're they are working against each other. They're mutually exclusive worldviews. And the worldview that's going to best explain reality is going to be the worldview that ultimately wins. And it's not a competition, but nobody gets onto a, a baseball field in the middle of a baseball game and starts playing football and expects to win the baseball game, right? You're not going to bring a football to a baseball game. So we need to be aware of the reality that we are in and we need to hammer home. This reality can only be seen properly in one way. This worldview contrasts with other worldviews. The other worldviews cannot interpret reality. Therefore, the person perceiving and living the worldview is not operating in reality to the full extent of their potential. And to actuate this potenti potentiality, to make it whole, is to come full circle back into what you were created to be. So I hope this was helpful. I know it was pretty dense. Um, I like reading the more poetic stuff. I think it's it's easier for me to get through. My eyes start to glaze over about an hour in. So we're at, we're at we're two hours and change. So we're going to we're going to kill it here. Um, and you guys remember to um, subscribe to the channel or if you're on audio um, podcasters or whatever, we should be on all of them. I know Odyssey is pretty up to date. I checked it yesterday. It looks like I'm having some issues with Rumble and Rockfin. Uh, I, I set it up for the cryptocurrency or, or whatever you're supposed to do for Rockfin. I just have to get the episodes uploaded. It's not as user-friendly as I thought it was going to be. So I just need some time to do that. Maybe I'll do that this weekend to get those up there. 
uh, just so you guys have it on whatever platform, you know, you prefer to listen to it on. Um, you know, if we don't have guests, YouTube is the same as an audio for me, but uh, it's easier for me to see. Um, it's easier for me to see the metrics on YouTube. So that's kind of been the go to spot. And people like to watch videos of someone talking for some reason. So <laughs> um, all right, guys, you have a wonderful week. I appreciate all of you um, tuning in. We love you. God bless. And we will uh, talk to you all soon. Thank you.